Hi, this is Bud from Bud's RPG Review, and you are listening to Tale of the Manticore. The following podcast is intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to Tale of the Manticore, Season 2. Like the creature from which it takes its name, Tale of the Manticore is a mashup, a crossbreeding between two different species of storytelling. Here, you will find the unpredictability of old-school RPG paper and dice games with the storycraft of a dark fantasy novel. No character is sacred, and no character will be spared if the dice decide their fate is at hand. According to lore, the tale of a manticore is barbed with cruel iron spikes. There will be much pain in the days ahead. Last time on Tale of the Manticore. Chapter 43 is, more or less, about just one thing. The companions attempt to get through the smuggler's channel and escape Silmoral with their charge, Briar Patches. The greater part of the episode takes place in a narrow drainage tunnel that measures 20 feet from end to end. They face numerous problems here, but, like any D&D adventuring party is apt to do, they solve them one by one. There's a lock barring the way in, but Sean A successfully picks it. The water in the pipe is cold enough to potentially kill them, but Bazu prays for divine aid and receives a blessing that makes all of them immune to the cold. There is a second lock on the way out that Shawnee cannot defeat, but Catsbane thinks he knows a way to handle this problem too. We're about to find out if he's right. Chapter 44, Part 1, Day 120, Dawn, Party Status, Yellowfly, 30 of 30 hit points, Shawnee, 22 of 22, Jace, 31 of 31. Catsbane, 15 of 15. Spells available. Catsbane has memorized Magic Missile, Invisibility, and Web. There was a blinding flash as gouts of flames erupted from Catsbane's hands. Then they were gone, leaving behind a cloud of steam vapor. I saw those tears, exclaimed Shane. Catsbane, are you all right? Yellowfly was concerned, too. I believe it may have done what I intended, replied the magic user enigmatically. He was peering closely at the padlock he had just blasted with magical fire. You've melted the lock, haven't you? asked Yellowfly, impressed. You are quite the marvel, Catsbane. Oh no, I haven't. Uh, I don't believe I possess that sort of power. Well, you might warn us the next time you do something like that, complained a voice from the rear. Damn near blinded me. I'm sorry, Jace, Catsbane replied. And you might all want to get well back for this next part. Next part, echoed Shawnee. Yes, I'm going to... Well, um, it, uh, it doesn't bear explaining. You should all go back to the other end of the passage, just to be safe. The companions obeyed, ducking under the water level once again as they moved to the far side of the channel's pinched center. When Catsbane was alone on his side he proceeded to execute the final stage of his plan. Jace's belt buckle had melted over the padlock's keyhole and had hardened into a solid seal. Inside the lock was a quantity of his own spit and the dark crystal he had taken from Carrick's staircase. He spoke the word to activate it. Kira. Nothing visible happened, but Catsbane had armed the deadly little magical device by speaking the dwarvish word for winter. He stepped back as far as he could and then reapproached, one step at a time. He knew that the crystal would detonate when he or any living thing came close, but he didn't know how close he would need to be. Hopefully, not very. He had never actually seen one of these devices being used, but he reasoned that it would be best if he were as far away as possible when it exploded. Nothing happened on the first step, nor the second, but on the third. He felt it more than he heard it a kind of implosion that pulled all of the warmth out of the air in an instant before bursting out with a force so unimaginably cold that Catsbane's brain was confused and interpreted it as a wave of heat that flashed into his face and left it completely numb. 
The moisture in the air turned into ice crystals that remained suspended for a brief moment in space before the magic ended and they puffed out into little cottony clouds of vapor before his eyes. <coughs> Catsbane coughed and touched his nose. He couldn't feel the tip. The rest of his face felt as though he had a terrible sunburn. Otherwise, he was fine. The padlock had not fared so well, he was glad to see. It had been blown to bits, and little jagged-edged remnants of twisted metal were scattered atop the unbroken ice below the grate. The only part of the padlock that remained intact was the little U-shaped top piece by which it had once been fastened. It still rocked back and forth from the momentum of the blast. The rest of the grate was discolored and slightly bent, but otherwise undamaged. His idea to contain the blast inside the lock itself seemed to have worked perfectly. Smiling to himself, Catsbane waded back through the channel, gathered the others, and together they returned in single file. Then they opened the grate and crawled out into the winter air where dawn colored the snow a soft buttermilk yellow. I considered rolling to see whether or not Catsbane's plan would work, but I reconsidered. Sacrificing a valuable magical item to bypass this obstacle felt like more than a fair trade, so in the end I chose to let it succeed by DM Fiat. Being so close to the blast does hurt Cat's Bane a little. He's going to sustain a d6 of damage. It would have been a lot more if the blast hadn't been contained so well. Here's the roll. Three points. A six would have indicated he'd been hit by some of the shrapnel from the lock as it blew apart, but a three is just frostburn from being too close to the blast. While I've got my dice out, there's at least one other roll I need to make. I want to know what the weather is like outside. It might matter. As usual, I'll roll a d20 to determine that. The lower the roll, the more extreme it will be. Rolling. Okay, I got an 8. I think this means that there's wind and snowfall, but we're talking light flurries, not a blizzard. I was actually hoping for a snowstorm. Weather like that would have made it easy for the companions to get away from the city unseen. As it is, I think they're going to have to endure one more wandering encounter roll to see if they're either spotted by sentries atop the walls or if they encounter guards patrolling outside and around the city. This will actually be the fifth or sixth wandering encounter roll I've made for the party's escape attempt, so I think it'll be the last one. If they can get past this roll, they can get away. Here's the roll. A one on a d6 will indicate there is an encounter. I got a three, so it looks like they get away clean. There is one last thing to mention, however. The Rosedale district is on the east side of the city, and the party needs to go west to reach Nepule. They can't go north around the city because there's a huge cliff drop off there. They also can't safely go south because that would require passing in front of the main city gate, where they would be very likely to be spotted. It's daylight after all, and Briar Patches is actively being hunted. This leaves me with the question, what is the best and most logical thing for the party to do? They could go east to Mirpool, but I don't think they'll be in any hurry to go back there. They could also go southeast to Domor, maybe hole up at the Happy Harpy Inn as they have in the past. I've got one more idea, but I need to do a little research before I can say it's a viable option. Stand by. I'm going to go learn about lakes in winter. I'll be right back. Okay, I've just been reading up on whether or not it's possible for boats to travel on lakes during winter. I had this idea that the PCs could go to Mirpool and immediately hire a boat that travel west over Blue Heron Lake. You know, in real life I live in Toronto, which is right on Lake Ontario, one of the Great Lakes. You'd think I'd know about this stuff. Yeah, it turns out my guess was wrong though. I thought it would be possible, but it really isn't. So it looks like Domor is the only good option remaining. The Dungeons & Dragons Podcast UK presents The Secrets of the Silver City. Join us for a homebrew actual play fantasy adventure in which our would-be heroes set out on a mission across the plain of Innistrad on a mild, grimdark yarn. With information to gather and answers to find, their path leads them through many unexpected twists and turns, meeting some amazingly colourful characters along the way. Starring Quinn Digremont, the plucky paladin. Oh! What's up, who shot you? Now it's an attack. <laughs> you can't call that a messaging system. Ogvar Shurfort. A rugged ranger. Can someone get it out? I say, uh, that's not very sporting, is it? Elora Greyvale, the sassy sorceress. I'm taking a nap, guys. Her eyes roll back in her head and she's just like, oh, and that's it. That's the last thing you hear from her. Mm, I do think so too. And Cado Chasseur, the all-consuming cleric. They're well prepared, aren't they? 
I think we might have been rumbled. Awesome. Oh. With immersive RP, combat, magic, humour and emotion, not to mention the inevitable disastrous dice rolls and the chaos that those bring forth. Join our all British podcast crew in an entertaining tale not to be missed. Listen now on all major streaming services. Pick up the links from our Facebook group or website. Search the Dungeons and Dragons Podcast UK or via Twitter at Podcast Team UK. Chapter 44, Part 2, Day 121, Evening, Party Status, Yellowfly. 30 of 30 hit points. Shawnee, 22 of 22. Jace, 31 of 31. Catsbane, 13 of 15, having gained one hit point from natural healing over the course of a day. Spells available. Catsbane has memorized read languages, magic missile, invisibility, and web. Yellowfly had changed his mind three times over the question of how long they should stay with Donick. He figured they should either leave as soon as possible, or else wait a long while. In either case, he knew he preferred to pass by Silmoral at night, in the dark, when the time came. The trouble was that, if it was too dark for the patrols and sentries to see them, it would also be too dark for them to find the path, so how could they travel? This problem was solved when, in discussion with Catsbane, the magic user casually mentioned that he had recently learned how to see in the dark and could lead them. At one time, Yellowfly might have found such a comment disquieting, but not anymore. Catsbane's skills had, time and again, been their salvation, and it seemed they would be once again. The full moon had been a couple of weeks ago, and now only a sliver of the celestial body hung in the night sky. Yellowfly considered their chances to travel unseen in the small hours were very good. Furthermore, he didn't want to cause hardship for his friend Donick any more than was necessary. It wasn't that the Happy Harpy was too busy to accommodate them, quite the opposite. During the winter months, business slowed considerably. The thing was, Domor was not such a big town that the presence of six outsiders could go unnoticed for very long. It was one thing to have hidden there from the Winks, but if this new captain, Krell was his name, if he expanded his manhunt to include the small towns and villages around Silmoral, if his men started going door to door and intimidating the townsfolk, well, he didn't want to put Donick through such an ordeal. Beyond that, he simply wanted to get this job over with. Briar Patches did not make for good company. It was amazing that he had made a career out of being fun to spend time with. Whatever had happened to this man, it must have drained the joy out of him completely. The ex-royal jester had gone straight to bed when they had arrived at the Happy Harpy, still refusing to talk, and Briar was not the only member of their group in a dark mood. Jace kept bringing up the subject of his mentor, Nudge Pickens. How many times did Yellowfly have to explain that Lord Rabbit did not know Pickens personally and could not contact him? Their whole organization was structured so that one member couldn't finger the others if caught. This became even more true the higher up the ranks the guild members climbed, but Jace seemed preoccupied over his concern for the man. Yellowfly even wondered if he might wake up to find that Jace had left them. Luckily, that had not happened. Yesterday had been spent traveling to Domor and beyond, to the Harpy, which was located on the far side, but not too far from, Rull. This morning, Yellowfly had put five gold pieces into Donick's hands in payments for their rooms. Donick had protested, of course, but Yellowfly had explained that the extra money was for clothes and rations. He needed his friend to go into town and make some purchases for him. Now it was evening, and they were getting ready to leave. Donick had bought some good, warm clothes made of wool. He had also thought to buy some extra thick woolen socks and two days worth of rations for each of them. Before the companions left, Shawnee asked Bazu if he might pray once again so that they would not feel the cold as they traveled. But Bazu gave her a look of reproach, explaining tersely that the Lord of Light's favors were not given for the sake of mere comfort. Chastened, Shawnee had pulled up her hood and taken the lead, walking out of the Happy Harpy Inn, pointed northwest in the direction of Silmoral, which they hoped to bypass during the middle of the night on their way west. The others followed, tromping through the snow and pulling their new cloaks tight against the bitter wind. Between the Lines A map of Camertine would look something like this. Take a vellum scroll, unfurled long ways. Along the top would be the sagging shoreline of Blue Heron Lake, a body of water that connects most Camertinian settlements. Under, there's a vaguely T-shaped road with the intersection at Silmoral South Gate. It plunges south towards Brannan and beyond, where it forks to the west on the way to Camranth, 
and continues south along the unimaginatively named South Road to the border town of Burke. But this part of Camertine's geography is more important to the events of Season 1. For Season 2, we return to the horizontal bar of the T and the two roads that reach out to the east and to the west from the capital city. Going east, spaced roughly one day's walk distant from each other, are the towns of Mirpool, Rayford, and Clearwater. Nestled under these are the farming villages of Domor and Rull. Going west of Silmoral, we find several places of interest and towns that have barely or never been mentioned in this tale. But this is where our PCs are heading, and so the time has come to study this part of the map specifically. The west road threads a line between the coast and the northern edge of the Brentwood, hugging the shore most of the time. The hidden grotto where Yellowfly's gang first met High Priestess Araness is just a few hours in that direction, if one knows where to find it. Going further in that direction takes us to Westmire, a barracks town whose primary purpose is to house Silmoral's military might. Another day to the west and we're in Black Creek, a combination fishing and farming village where more folks would speak with an Impulic accent than not. Finally, another day's travel to the west is Nipule. Nipule has its own rich history. It was essentially annexed by Camertine over 300 years ago, in the year 244, by the Regent Thury. Despite the passage of time, it seems Nimpulics have long memories and resentment persists. Or perhaps it's the Silmorillian penchant for reminding Nimpulics of their low status by consistently making them the butt of every joke and by exploiting them at every opportunity. Since the audio medium is not the easiest way to communicate cartography, I'm going to post a map of this part of Merith on the Tale of the Manticore blog after the release of this episode. It's at taleofthemanticore.blogspot.com. Check it out if you're curious. It's going to take the companions three days, traveling on foot and through harsh winter conditions, to reach Westmire. One more day gets them to Black Creek. At the end of day five, they'll finally reach Nipuel, which is their ultimate destination. Along the way, they'll need to camp outside unless they can arrange accommodations with local farmers. Since I don't see this part of the story as making particularly good audio drama, I'm going to fast forward to their arrival in Westmire, still two days away from Nepule. I'm also hand-waving any chance for wandering encounters during this time. The reason for this is that Catsbane's infravision should allow them to avoid unwanted meetings, at least with other people. I'm sure they'll find themselves back in danger soon enough anyway. Okay, let's put a pin in the PC's plotline for now and check in on the rest of the story's major players. To the east, in Mirpool, Romola and Nightmother are licking their wounds. They have not been destroyed, but they have been defeated for now. Nightmother is still weakened from creating and maintaining the harpy, and Romola will be healing from various and rather serious physical wounds for the foreseeable future. There is one thing working to their advantage, and that is the delivery of a new captive child to replace the ones who Nightmother has needed to consume in the process of restoring her strength. This new child is, of course, the daughter of Nudge Pickens. Sir of the Mad, after hearing how Krell's raid on the Ironmonger shop failed, decided that it would be a good time to be away from Silmoral, so he had traveled east to deliver his hostage, make good on his threat, and collect some manner of payment in trade. Back at Whitestone Castle, the search for the fugitive jester continues. Shortly after Briar's disappearance, Sindwan ordered the inner city gates sealed, and then even the south gate was sealed, so that all travel in and out of Silmoral was prevented, or at least heavily scrutinized. But now that Briar Patches has been missing for several days, I wonder if Krell and the others will decide to expand their search outside the city walls. They would certainly search the walls themselves for any possible escape routes or signs of passage. Would they find anything? Possibly. Not likely. No, I think they still believe the royal jester is hiding in town. Still, it's possible their patrols will turn up some clue indicating his escape. What's reasonable? A 20% chance? That sounds about right. Let's roll it. I got a 77. The unlocked padlock on the smuggler's channel is not discovered. This is not a great surprise. After all, considering that the channel is full of icy water, who in their right mind would even attempt something so insane? Chapter 44, Part 3, Day 127, Late Afternoon Party Status The party's status is unchanged, with the exception of Catsbane, who has, through natural healing, been restored to his maximum of 15 hit points. They had spent the last two nights on the march, being led through the dark and cold by Catsbane, whose voice whispered from up ahead over and over, This way! Mind your step here. Move a bit to your right. 
During the day, they tried to remain as inconspicuous as possible, stealing a few hours here and there whenever they found a copse of trees or a gully to hide them. In one case, an abandoned barn gave them shelter. Now, as they approach the town of Westmire, the barracks town with its mott and bailey surrounded by wooden palisades, anxiety began to compete with the cold and discomfort to be the primary subject of thought and complaint. Fly. Do, do you think we could? Shawnee's voice shook, and her teeth chattered. She was looking at the dingy cluster of buildings outside the palisades that formed the town itself as if it were a meal. Too dangerous, replied Yellowfly, reluctantly, and after a pause. But I agree that we need to get some warmth in our bones. How about, um, that place? Suggested Gatsbane, pointing at a farmhouse up ahead. Well, we can try. Maybe trade a little labor for a few hours rest in the barn, if there's room. They knocked on the front door to the farmhouse, and eventually it was opened by a blotchy-faced man who looked as though he had never held a bar of soap. A dog could be heard barking behind him within the house. What do you want? He said, squinting at the party members. We're travelers, and we're cold, looking to warm ourselves by your fire. Perhaps sleep a few hours in your hayloft if you'd be so generous. Now we're willing to work. What kind of work? Anything. We can split logs, mend clothes, cook, clean. Whatever needs doing, we can do it for you. The farmer sucked his teeth and looked at Yellowfly's sword. All right, but you hand over your bags to me for safekeeping. You might as well know I've nothing worth stealing. So if that's your aim, you're wasting your time. You understand? Now you may hold on to our bags and weapons, and I will do right by you. I swear by Vesseluna. Yeah, I don't put much stock in that. Anyway, come on in. Oslov's my name. Just me and me dog, Errol, live here now. Wife died. Lots of work to be done. Chapter 44 Part 4 Day 124 Night Krell had always known he was destined for greatness. He was the one to have been selected for a proper education. His gifts had been recognized over and over again during his young adulthood. He had been favored by His Majesty's courtesans, and he had been given the job of Captain of the City Watch when Belloc had grown too weak to execute his office or even to defend himself. And look at him now. He had put Culfrey into his own dungeon. Now it was Krell who sat at the King's table in the King's Solar. It was Krell making all the important decisions in Whitestone Castle, and it was his voice the guards obeyed. He wore the King's own sword on his belt, and Krell smiled to think of it. He had even started sleeping in the king's own bed. Something he had not expected when he allowed himself this luxury was the woman that came to him every night. She was the king's plaything, no doubt, and indeed she was a creature of royal quality. For the past three nights, Krell had slept in the king's bed, and each night she had come. The young woman would glide like a moonbeam into the king's chamber, now his chamber, really, in the middle of the night. She would drop her clothes to the floor and slip under the covers with him, all heat and softness. The first time it happened, Krell had been alarmed, thinking that she was an intruder, another assassin such as the one Bellic had succumbed to. But it became obvious right away that she was not there to do him harm. Quite the opposite. They never conversed, though she sometimes muttered words in a language she did not understand during the peaks of their lovemaking. This exotic concubine of the king's, likely brought from Zaysha and existing only to satisfy his desires, did she care that she now slept with a different man? Probably not. The woman never lingered when they were through. She collected her clothes off the floor and slipped back out the door just as silkily as she had come in. Presently, Krell was lying wide awake in the warm tangle of bedsheets, inhaling the vestiges of her perfume. Tonight he had asked her for her name. She had giggled and pushed at him playfully. He had assumed that she did not understand the question, but then, still laughing a little, she had told him. Krell's self-satisfied smile broadened. He had it all. Power, respect, and now even his basest desires were attended. He fell asleep thinking of her name over and over in his head. Soft Sivan. 
beauteous Sivan, his very own perfect Sivan. Thanks so much for listening to Tale of the Manticore. If you've enjoyed the show and would like to help to support it, there are loads of ways to do so. You can recommend it online or to friends. You can like and repost episode announcements on social media. You can pick up One Shot in the Dark, the Pendulum World Building Tool, or Encyclopedia Manticorica on DriveThruRPG. And finally, you can rate or view the show on your podcatcher of choice. At the end of the day, there's no show without listeners, and so my sincere thanks to all the supporters out there. I'd love to share one of your kind reviews at this time. This one is from the Podcast Addict app and was posted by Steelstash. Steelstash writes, A great podcast that is an excellent blend of emergent storytelling and dice. Hey, I know that handle. That's Steelstash of the excellent Lonely TTRPG podcast, whose ad has been featured on the show in the past. Thanks for that very kind review, Steelstash. Let me in turn recommend your own. Steelstash will guide you smoothly through dozens of solo RPGs on his show. A great listen. I'd be nowhere without my talented cast of voice actors. Here are the folks who breathed life into this episode. Kyle Ellen is here, as usual, in the role of Cat's Bane, as is Kevin Berenger as Jace. There's also a newcomer to the show. The farmer, Rosloff, is voiced by Bradley Anahua. Bradley is the author of Galileo 2, Judgment Day, published by Lamentations of the Flame Princess, now available in online stores. Follow Bradley at Bradley Anahua. That's B-R-A-D-L-E-Y-A-N-A-H-U-A. Thanks to Bradley, Kevin, and Kyellen. By the way, I'm often recommending Kyellen's music to people. If you haven't had the chance to listen on SoundCloud yet, I've used the track Carved in Stone in this episode. Check the show notes for details. Be sure to check out his other compositions, too. If any listeners would like to reach out to me, I'm at Manticore Tale on X and Tale of the Manticore Podcast on Instagram. If you prefer email, I'm at taleofthemanticore at gmail.com. I reply to every email I receive. Finally, I keep a blog where I post all kinds of show and RPG-related things, like art, maps, tables, crafts, and show notes. You can find it at taleofthemanticore.blogspot.com. The adventure will continue on the next episode of Tale of the Manticore. It's the story where chaos rolls. Hello, everyone. I'm Father Aaron. The Dungeon Minister. And I'm here to invite you to... Clericon. Okay, sound effects. What's a Clericon? I'm glad I asked. It's an old-school RPG convention, that's what. And it's happening November 3rd through 5th in Glen Williams, Ontario, just west of Toronto. Who's invited? Well, you, for one. Also this guy, might have heard of him. John from Tale of the Manticore... Yeah, John will be there to run games and rub shoulders. So will Sean from Mage's Musings and Daniel from Bandit's Keep. And, of course, yours truly, the Dungeon Minister, and the gang from the Honeywood Campaign. Check out clericon.rsvpfy.com. That's clericon.rsvpify.com for more information and to register.